So uh, welcome to a quick interview with TNT, Sylvain Minot. Hi, Sylvain. Hey, how, how are you doing? Good, good. Just yeah. got back from Fostem. Yeah. 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 Um, and we're here to have a little chat about uh, the Tiny Tape Out 3 and uh, hopefully all the rest multiplexer. Um, so Sylvain's been doing some work on that and the repo is public. We've had some feedback from people already. If you want to follow along, um, I'll put the link in the video so you can take a look. Um, and I think maybe it might be good to start off with that picture that you drew. So for some context, Tiny Tape Out 1 and 2 had a system very similar to this. This is the Tiny Tape Out 2 die. And we have a, um, a controller here that samples um, eight inputs and then clocks them through to your design. Let's say it's this one. Um, then your design processes those inputs or does whatever it wants. And then we clock the outputs, keep on going all the way through to the end. And then they come back around and go out via the controller to the output. So that's a very simple way of doing it and it only needs four lines or so between each module but it's very slow the more modules you have the slower it is so with tiny tape out three um sylvan Minot uh, um, suggested this kind of layout well it was actually we had a, a meeting with maybe eight or ten people um and there was a bunch of uh, designs presented um and this was what we've kind of uh, come up with so sylvan maybe you can talk us through what is going on here in this picture um yeah so the general idea is to have sort of a spine architecture where you have like a, you can see in the center you have like a, a giant vertical spine which is going to be all the signals uh carrying all the input and outputs um directly and then those will connect to some horizontal blocks so the, the spine itself, the vertical one, is just wires. Like there's mm -hmm. no logic whatsoever. Uh, so just wires at the top level. Then you have the uh, horizontal gray blocks, uh, and these are basically the mixers um, that do both the horizontal distribution and collection of the signal, uh, and also the muxing. And uh, yeah, the muxing is uh, explained at the at the bottom. So if you look at an output and I mean, output from, you know, from the inside the chip to outside the chip, you basically collect them from the various blocks. Um, is that here on the left here? Yes, exactly. It is there. You connect them from the various blocks. You make them go through a first layer of a 41 multiplex block uh, or cell because it exists at a single cell in, in Sky 130. And then go through basically a sort of a tree of uh, tri-state buffers. So in this case, I mean, in the diagram that, that showed here, you have like a, a tri-state buffer after each mux, and that goes into what would be the, the horizontal bus. Uh, and then at the output of the horizontal bus, you have, again, uh, another strong tri-state buffer, which is either going to be enabled or disabled, that's going to drive the vertical spine. So that's for um, outputs, basically. And for inputs from outside the chip going to the user modules uh there's basically sort of like of clock distributions three here i only uh shown one uh buffer that basically takes the signal from the vertical spine and sends into a bunch of and gates and of course the and gates are gonna serve as buffers themselves uh and the output of each and gate goes to the module and this is to guarantee that every module when it's not being enabled, actually gets zero at its input, which has the advantage of, um, you know, if you have a reset N, reset inverted signal, that means that your block is held in reset uh, when it's not enabled. Uh, same for the clock, that means that the clock is not toggling while your block is not enabled, so it doesn't burn power for nothing, that kind of things. And you have like a, a deterministic uh, state, basically. Uh, now, something that actually changed uh, compared to the di diagram that I that is above is that in the current implementation, the horizontal block actually goes all the way, and the spine kind of goes over it. Rather, uh, I didn't cut the horizontal block in two like I did, okay. uh, like I've shown there, but that's like a minor implementation detail. And something you can see also in the top diagram is how we organize the grid for to support larger 
size of blocks. We still have a very regular grid, but they can be like uh, multiplied by some size. They can be at maximum two, uh, two blocks in high, basically, which is actually slightly more than twice the size, simply because there is some margin between blocks, which obviously you, you can use if you're filling all of it. And same thing for the uh, horizontal. They can be either one, two, three, or four block um, wide. I mean, technically, they could be also eight wide. Like, there is no reason. Um, uh, and then something that's not actually shown in, in the diagram, but that's in the current implementation, is that all the gray blocks are actually the same. Uh, it doesn't matter if there is a, an actual block connected or not to, to it. Um, if there isn't, the port is still present and it will just be tied off with um, just, just a wire. There's, you can basically make a wire that's just going to connect all the inputs and ground them to make sure that they are at a fixed state and known without the need for logic. And so that means all the gray blocks can be basically hardened once and um, instantiated multiple times. Um, same thing for the addressing of each block, because obviously each block kind of needs to know its address. No, the addressing isn't done linearly. So it's not like block, it's not like module one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, it's addressing by which position in X, Y it's uh, connected to basically. Okay. And the, uh, the Y addressing is actually made by uh, straps. So each gray block has a few uh, pins that fix its address that you strap either to one or to zero, depending on which address the block has, uh, a bit like you would do like an I squared C memory where you have like those address pins that you need to, to strap to what, whatever you want the address to be. Such a general idea. If you're interested in uh, following along, um, then you can take a look in the um, proto directory where the um, the HDL is. And there's also a make file. Um, do you want to just talk a bit? I mean, we've got we've got people can read this so they can work out what, what all the things do. But do you want to just to kind of explain? Yeah, what's... I can I can uh, I can explain a little bit of what's uh, yeah. what's in there. So the if we start at the top level, that would be a TT top somewhat surprisingly. And TTTOP is really a module which does only wiring. So it's, it doesn't have any logic, uh, which is important because um, if, if your module has logic on in it, even if it's just a fixed one or a fixed zero, that kind of things, uh, that means that you need a standard cell grid, it needs to be hardened and stuff like that. While here, this module really just makes connection, um, which is purely routing. So it doesn't really need to be um, like hardened as a, as a cell. It's just connecting things together, basically. Yeah, that's going to go in um, the user project wrapper. Exactly. That's basically what's yeah. going to be the, the, the project wrapper itself, which is not going to have a, a cell grid. It's just going to instantiate the sub blocks and wire them up together. Um, okay. So. What are the things that it connects together? Well, you have the uh, user modules. Um, so, so the user module are instantiated always. It always instantiates TT user module, and it just gives it the grid position to where it's going to, where that user module is. And then there is basically uh, TT user module dot v dot Mac, which is sort of a template. And that's actually the part which, depending on the grid position it's at is going to instantiate the actual user module because of using they're all different. So they need to all have different names and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so this is generated dynamically uh, based on the a YAML configuration file um, where you have an example, uh, TT user module.yaml, yeah, where you just give the grid position and basically the name of the user module you want to instantiate at that grid position. Okay. Um, yeah. So one layer from the user module, the user module are basically connected to those gray blocks, the, the horizontal distribution and muxing, and that's mm -hmm. the TT row mux. Um, and so the, the, the TT row mux is 
also most i mean there isn't that much logic in it uh it's mostly again just instantiating things and you can see that we instantiate the mux4 cells um a little lower yeah there you have the mux4 uh, cell and then afterwards we after each mux4 we instantiate a tri-state buffer okay and uh then this goes basically to the uh this connects to basically to the spine again uh, with a tri-state buffer which is a little bit hidden it's it's like in the bottom top thing there is like a wait no actually yeah, it's not there uh actually oh, actually it's not it's not in this uh model i think because this is just the logic model i mean it has a, a bunch of the structure already but it doesn't instantiate the um the exact cell already and so i don't think i've put that uh that final tri-state buffer is not actually there okay at the moment uh oh yeah it is sorry 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 it's at the very top at line, uh, um, line 88, 88, yeah. That's the final buffer, the final tri-state buffer that connects uh, what's called here bus, which is like the horizontal distribution bus to the spine, which is the vertical distribution bus. Basically. Okay. Uh, so if you look, then uh, the other things is the controller. Uh, TT control. Yeah. TT control, yes. And here again, there is very little logic. It's mostly uh, connecting the various pad uh, input, output, and output enable to the vertical spine. That's all the spine mapping things. And then the only other thing is the selection, which is a, basically a counter. Uh, it's a 10 bit counter. Um, we have five bits to select the row, five bit to select the uh, column which gives us 1,024 modules, which is way more than we need because we won't have that many row or column. Mm -hmm. That splits the X and Y part uh, more easily. Uh, and the counter is implemented as, uh, I think it's called an asynchronous counter or ripple counter, where mm -hmm. basically the inverted output of each bit is fed as the clock of the next one. Um, the advantage of that is that Every time you toggle the input, the counter increments by itself. There is uh, no system clock or anything like that. It's directly the the signal, uh, the increment signal that you feed that serves to increment the counter. And there is also no things like old time violation or anything like that because the data input of each flip flop comes from itself basically. So it it's loops back to itself. So there is no clock skew or anything like that. That's probably, I think, the most reliable way to make a counter. Um, and that's pretty much the only logic in that block, actually. Uh, OK. Yeah. So um, from the outside, let's say you want to um, activate the design that's on um, position 3.3. Three. What do you need mm -hmm. to do? So you're going to, you basically, so 3.3 three would be um, 3 shifted by 5. Mm -hmm. Uh, plus three, so that's gonna be like uh, three multiplied by uh, thirty-two. That's ninety-six plus three. That's ninety-eight. Okay. So you need to load ninety-eight pulse. So what you're gonna do is um, you have a global. Um, you have a reset and an increment signal and a global enable signal. So what you do is you make sure that enable is low, reset is low, and increment is low. Then at some point you raise reset to um get the controller out of reset mm -hmm. you inject 98 uh sorry 99 i don't know i said 96 plus 3 and i said 98 but that's 99 obviously <laughs> um you then basically generate 99 rising edge on the increment signal mm -hmm. so you send 99 pulse and once that's done you know that the counter is going to hold 99 and the only thing you need to do is then raise the in a, the global enable signal, uh, which is control A9 in the input. And then um, at that point, that will basically uh, remove the last uh, kind of gate to enable. The, the address is decoded completely combinatorially 
across the, the various stages of muxing. But the very last stage, there is an end with the global enable signal. And so the moment you lift that signal, uh, kind of the last barrier to actually enabling the, the you know, the end gate for the, um, the inputs and uh, the tri-state buffer for the output will be lifted and they, they will be enabled. And at that point, all the combinatorial logic when you know all the delays that that does will hopefully have been resolved mm -hmm. uh, because you're actually like in complete control you can wait as much as you want between the last pulse you send and raising the enable signal um, you would complete control of the timing to ensure that this is actually going to work nice so um hopefully what we'll be able to do is that caravel the risk five processor and it's um, surroundings will be able to do that for us somehow. So it will be able to use the GPIOs in like a management mode or something, and um, we'll be able to select a, a, des a design somehow, and then it will program those pulses. Um, is that correct? Yes, that's, that's the hope. And that's uh, some of the... Uh... So you, you just need uh, three IOs basically to configure which, um, you know, design is active and then mm -hmm. you have you also ideally ideally need to provide like a reset for the user module and a clock for the user module yeah although although those signals are not um especially in any way that's kind of the way things have been envisioned is that two of the inputs uh, one is dedicated for yeah. clock, one is dedicated yeah. for the reset um and so on the caravel itself like on the if you take the IO linearly from, you know, I think we start at number IO six up to, to till thirty eight. There are some IO reserved right next to the um, uh, the, the IO that that talks to the the controller to the TT control, mm -hmm. and those IO can be taken over by the caravel. Like in mm -hmm. theory, the caravel can write to some registers and basically switch them to um, caravel mode or, or management suck mode. At which point, they can be used as general job, uh, sorry, as general purpose GPIO by the Risk Five caravel. Yeah, and so it should be able to emit the pulse mm -hmm. by itself to configure any single fixed design. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if that goes wrong, then we can just have like an external micro. Exactly. exactly. Even if the caravel um, if uh, management stock doesn't work for some reason or whatever, we can just not use it. Um, all the IOs, so when you harden the project in the recent MPW, you basically select what the default mode is. Yeah. And so if we set that up properly to basically be a uh, user IO, uh, that means that even if the management stock doesn't do anything, we can uh, hold it in reset and just not use it whatsoever and then just have like a small microcontroller on the side that um, can send the pulses as required to configure the module either from you know, a couple of rotary encoder or, for, or, or whatever. Deep switches um, or whatever. Yeah, whatever. Exactly, whatever. We can make people like count. Well, yeah. yeah, you need you need to clock like a thousand. Yeah, the guy who is like at position 1023 is. Yeah, he's going to be gutted. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, so then um, it's worth just pointing out as well uh, that um, maybe this would be easier if I um, if I show this again. Oh, yeah, here we go. Um, so with tiny tape out one and two, you just had eight inputs and eight outputs, and this is now the uh, module definition for one of the examples. Yes. Um, so you've got... Um, the eight ins and eight outs as before, but now we have um, eight bidirectional IOs. Mm -hmm. uh, so by controlling the output enable, you'll either turn them to be outputs or inputs. Um, so that's good. That in, that enables doing interesting things with bidirectional communication, but also could give you sixteen ins or sixteen outs. Um, yeah, exactly. You you have more flexibility, and because like in the in the previous one, you know, people wanted to do SPI or quad SPI for to add RAM, or if you even if you want to do like I C without you know using too many IOs, you need mm -hmm. that dynamic control. 
Yeah. Um, and then we also have, like you mentioned, the, an extra clock and reset as, as separate signals. So we've added another uh, 10 IOs. So that's uh, pretty nice. And then the other, like, the, is really the major. Um, I'm just going to stop. I'm just going to take uh, this bit out. Stop. Sh stop screen. The other really big advantage is that now everything is combinational. There's no sampling. There's no clocking through a long scan chain. So yeah. that means you just have the combinational delays of one or two levels of muxes in a tri-state um, for your outputs and then like that AND gate and um, a tri-state, was it, for the inputs? Yeah, that's that's in the ROMX. There will be like a couple of more tri-state in the controller itself possibly, mm -hmm. but uh, or yeah. buffers rather delays. But yeah, um, yeah. now hopefully those delay will be short and consistent. But uh, that should definitely be, be a low, much higher, you know, in yeah. Output than yeah. So we were hoping for kind of like a top speed of like ten kilohertz with tiny tape out two. Would you like? Would you like to hazard a guess what we might achieve with tiny tape out three? I mean, uh, the thing is, there's not that much limit. I think to the speed itself, it's more that you whatever you talk to to the outside if you need to get back if you need to have like a you know a round trip mm -hmm. uh the latency uh, is kind of your limiting factor but like you could as far as i i don't see any way that you couldn't use the full capability of the io if you or if you were right. unidirectional because it's yeah. yeah so if you were just doing say streaming video you should be able to get like toggle signals at, at the bandwidth of your GPIO. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. That's such an upgrade. Yeah. So, um, I think that's probably enough on, uh, the, the tiny tape out three multiplexer. And, um, if you're watching and you're interested, then check out the repo, run the test, have a look, um, see what you think. Feel free to give us feedback in the tiny tape out discord channel. Um, let's talk. Uh, briefly about the next step then. Mm -hmm. So just load up my notes. Um, so that was all done as part one. And then part two is translate the model into hand coded standard cells. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, so some of the constructs that are made here, I'm not even sure that they will synthesize properly. Uh, like because I don't think uh, I don't think Yosis can infer tri-state buffers for uh, Sky 130, for instance. So I don't think that's going to work at all. Uh, so to, at the moment, it's purely useful for simulation and checking like it's mm. it's going to work. I can I can um, tell you that it, it can because that's what I do with can? the multi-project tools. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, then never mind. Uh, there, um, but yeah, there may be other things. This is just something to be aware of. Yeah, but I I don't think, for instance, that the Mux four is going to be instantiated as a mm. Mux four cell. I don't know. At least I, last time I tried, it wasn't. But uh, because that's not a very con common construct. Um, but yeah, the general idea is to um, instantiate them manually to have more control over what's done and things like the strength of buffer, um, mm -hmm. especially since. Um, I don't know how well the the tools are good at, uh, you know, we know that the vertical spine is going to be fairly long, connected to a bunch of inputs. So we typically want like a strong buffer probably mm -hmm. at the output, for instance. Um, and the tools is probably not going to have any knowledge of that at the time we synthesize the controller, for instance, because... It has no idea what the controller is it's controlling. To. Yeah, yeah. Um, other things is to um, um, sorry the okay. yeah the, the ripple counter the ripple <laughs> counter also you know it's a single cell that exists. We know we can instantiate it and to make sure that it's uh, synthesized the way we want to because uh, because each flip flop. Uh, as it's clock connected to the 
data output of the previous one. We don't want it to start generating like a clock synthesis tree for every clock input, for instance, that kind of mm -hmm. things. Um, and uh, yeah, the other things would be that I would certainly do is to manually instantiate diodes, for instance, for all the um, all the inputs because like they come from very long lines from the outside, uh, and I'd rather have them protected. Um, antenna diode. Yeah, antenna diode. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Um, so in general, it's yeah, it's just to have more control and have more um, reproducibility mm -hmm. um, for the next one. Um, but also one of the big reason would be for to even allow to do step three if we actually do it, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, step three would uh, pretty much require that, which is like scripting various things to have control of the placement and uh, the routing. Um, and at that point, you don't have a choice. You need to know exactly which cell you're connecting because, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I think, I mean, that's, I think that's about it from my side. Any last things from you? Uh, no, not really. Um, okay. what's it like, um, doing more ASIC work and cause you're more used to doing FPGA work, aren't you? Well, what I you mean, say, it's just the same. At the moment, it's not that much different because I haven't actually touched much of the ASIC aspect of things, except for the fact that tri-state buffer exists. Mm. Um, but for, uh, yeah, for the next step, it's going to be probably more into the ASIC yeah, realm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> digging a little deeper, um, digging, yeah, again, because it's been some time since. Uh, mm. Yeah, MPW2, was it? No, I only I only entered something in MPW1. Ah, that's it, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and tiny, the, the, the work I did for the first tiny tape, the first yeah. and second tiny tape. Yeah. Cool. Okay, well, thanks again for your time, Sylvain. Um, and Good we'll get you on again once we've uh, finished part two. Okay.